All right, thank you, Audrey. Four, three, five. Okay, so our lesson tonight, I have um, decided to title this Two Camps, and we'll see the appropriateness of this title as we move along. And as we get into this, um, I wanted to kind of step back before we go specifically in this text and put it into its context. And not only the context of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, but the larger, larger context of the Old Testament. So we're going to go all the way back to Genesis, and I want to share Genesis 49. We're going to read 8 through 12, and these are the, the prophecies given to the 12 sons of, of Jacob. And this is the, the prophecy given specifically to Judah, and I want to share a portion of it and then uh, discuss it briefly. Genesis 49, 8 through 12. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, and as a lioness, who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples." Binding his foal to the vine and his donkeys and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he has washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. I want to emphasize just a couple of things in here about what is promised to Judah. Uh, number one, it says, Your father's sons shall bow down before you. Your father Jacob's sons, the twelve tribes, will bow down to Judah is what this is saying. And then the, the next part, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. That essentially means the kingship will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff between his feet until tribute comes to him, until all are under subjugation to the king of Judah. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. So this was the prophecy way back in Genesis 49 that we get pertaining to Judah. Now, I want to jump to 1 Chronicles to just summarize what we've learned through 1 Samuel all the way up to the introductory of 1, 2 Samuel last week, which was chapter 1, and put it in the context of this. This is how 1 Chronicles chapter 10 summarizes everything that we've really studied for, I guess it's been a year now, that we've uh, been in the Samuels. And this is just a very simple statement. So Saul died for his breach of faith. He broke faith with the Lord and that he did not command of the Lord and also consulted a medium seeking guidance. He did not seek guidance from the Lord. Therefore, the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. That is where Second Samuel lives in this sentence right here. Therefore, the Lord put him to death, talking about Saul, that's what we saw in chapter 1, the end of 1 Samuel, and then into chapter 1 of 2 Samuel, and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. Now, the son of Jesse, if we follow that lineage back, would be the son of Judah. So what we have here is a continual unfolding of Genesis 49 taking place. And so all of 2 Samuel that, that we'll be looking at really is this manifestation of the kingdom of the son of Judah that will materialize. So that's kind of just getting us a kind of a large picture of what we have. Saul was displaced. The kingdom was turned over to David, who is the son of Jesse, who we could go on to say is the son of Judah. Now, more specifically, to get into our text, this is something to kind of remember for the ensuing chapters that we're going to be at. Chapters 2 through 5 record this rise of David to king over all Israel that we saw First Chronicles mention. These chapters really should be read together, and I would encourage you to do that, whether it's tonight or maybe before next week or maybe before each Sunday subsequently, read two through five together because it's really all one big story. Recall that our chapter markers and verse numbers are not original to the text, and if you, if you just glance at the titles, if you flip through these, you'll see that this is all one subject, and we can see it in the, in the chapters themselves. There's an in inclusio that we have that kind of puts the start of it in chapter 2 and the end of it in chapter 5. In chapter 2.11, you read that it says, And the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. 
Now if you look at chapter 511, and here I'm, king, oh, I got the wrong verse there, I'm sorry. It's, I did that, um, it's 5-5, five, five, I'm sorry, 5-5. Five, five. At Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, which is the same thing we saw in chapter 2, and then subsequently, and at Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. So there's two parts here. He reigned over Hebron, that's what 2 through 5 is going to tell us, and then it'll culminate in him being king of Israel, and we'll see that as we move on. So our outline tonight that we're going to look at in chapter 2 is pretty simple. It breaks down into three parts. The first one is two camps, and that's going to be verses 1 through 11. And then we have the field of swords, that's going to be 12 through 28. And then the two marches, and this is the beginning of the civil war in Israel, and that'll be the last few verses. So again, it's the two camps, the fields, the field of swords, and then the two marches. So we'll begin with the two camps, 1 through 11. And I'll just go back and read briefly these verses. After this, David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, Go up, David, go up. David said, To which shall I go up? And he said, To Hebron. Now this is the, the first part here, 1 through 4a. If we kept reading, it says, So David went up there, and his two wives also, Ahinoam of Jezreel, and Abigail, the widow the widow of Nabal of Carmel, Carmel, and David brought up his men who were with him, everyone with his household, and they lived in the towns of Hebron. And the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. So the men of Judah would be the men of David's tribe. Of His people came to him at that time, and they anointed him the king of Judah. And I, I just wanted to share some maps. I think it's always helpful to get the geography uh, when we're looking at this stuff. So if you recall, David was hanging out in the land of the Philistines, and he was in Ziklag. And so what we see here, the last time we saw him, he was in Ziklag. So now we actually get him moving back into the land of Judah. And notice he says what it says at first. He inquired of the Lord to see where he should go into Judah. And so... If in 1 Samuel 16, David was anointed king by God. He was told he would be the king. In this chapter, we see David anointed king by his own tribe. So we've had God anoint him, and now his people anoint him, and he goes in there. And it says the men of Judah, uh, I'm sorry, the men of David that went with him, 1 Chronicles 12 tells us, it gives us a little insight. It says, while he was in Ziklag, while he was out in exile, you could say, from day to day, men came to David to help him until there was a great army like an army of God. It kind of gives you an idea of the people that were going back into the land with him. So again, the Lord directs him to Hebron where he's anointed king. Now the significance of Hebron is because this was the only parcel of land that Abraham ever owned. It was the burial ground at Machpelah near Hebron where Abraham buried Sarah. And this was the beginning of Abraham's inheritance of the land. Again, it's the only piece that he ever owned. So it's kind of interesting when David says, where do I go? He sends him all the way back to where Abraham started, to that same plot of land. So if you think about it, David, who's going to inherit the land, begins at the same place that Abraham did. And again, the men of, God, the men of Judah say, you are our king. And what we see is the Lord's word coming to pass here. Again, I mentioned 1 Samuel 16. What we don't see in our text uh, very easily is that we're 13 years removed from that. David was but 17 years old back then. Uh, as we get into the chapter and we see that they let the, the 12 young men, they say, come down and, and fight. When this thing started, David was a young man. He was a 17-year-old that went down to fight. Um, so now this is 13 years later, he's 30 years old, and a lot of time has transpired, but what we see is that God's plan is still moving forward. What God has said would happen is still going forward. So that's the first part. The second part of David here is his appeal to allegiance to Jabesh Gilead, and that's 4B, 4B the second part of 
verse 4 through 7. It says, When they told David it was the men of Jabesh Gilead who buried Saul, David sent messengers to the men of Jabesh Gilead and said to them, May you be blessed by the, the Lord because you showed this loyalty to Saul your Lord and buried him. Now may the Lord show steadfast love and faithfulness to you, and I will do good to you because you have done this thing. Now therefore let your hands be strong and be valiant. For Saul your Lord is dead, and the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. So this is really interesting what he does here. He gives them a a commendation for their treatment of Saul and Jonathan. If you recall, they heard how they were treated, and they went and got their bodies and gave them their proper burial. So what he, he tells them, may you be blessed by the Lord for doing that. He says, may the Lord show steadfast love and faithfulness. And then catch what he says. He says, and I will do good to you because of this thing. And oh, by the way, let your hands be strong and valiant for Saul, your Lord is dead. And the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. So there's almost like a political move here. He is no doubt sincere with what he's telling them. But look again at the map. And see where Jabesh Gilead is. And you see where Hebron is. And David sends a message to them saying, Saul, your Lord is dead. But let me tell you, just so happens that Judah has made me king. I'm just throwing it out there. Judah's made me king. So he's kind of asking them for their allegiance. uh, Which would strategically give him an allegiance up in the north. So interestingly enough, we're not told directly what they uh, reply, but we're, we're, giving, we're given some insight as we get to the next part. So the first part of this, we saw David anointed king of Judah. And then the second part, we see someone else anointed king, and that's Ishboseth. And that picks up in verse 8. Ishbosheth is made king of Israel. So David's made king of Judah. Now we have Ishbosheth in Israel. And as we get into that, one thing I'd like to say is, well, here's the, um, we'll look at this map again. Um, when you see Ishbosheth, there's a good question to ask because some of the commentators would say that his original name was Ishbaal, which is B-A-A-L. And if you're familiar with that, that was the name of the Canaanite gods, is, is Baal. And that his name was Ishbaal and um, one commentator said, the original form seems to have been Ishbael, but because of the reluctance of post 7th century Hebrews to use the name Baal, the form Ishbosheth was substituted. In other words, it was several centuries later that they changed the name to Ishbosheth, supposedly, and that name means man of shame. So it's not like they upgraded his name, uh, they just didn't want to use Baal as his name, so they said he's a man of shame, which um, we'll go into, as we progress through these chapters, we'll see if that's the case or not. But So as we pick up in the text, verse 8, it says, But Abner, the son of Ner, now remember, David sent message to Jabesh Gilead saying, Consider what you'll do, your Lord is dead, you have no king, is what he's telling them. And the next thing we read is, But Abner, the son of Ner, commander of Saul's army, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim, and he made him king over Gilead and the Asherites and Jezreel and Ephraim and Benjamin and all Israel. And in some, he put him over 11 tribes. David's over one, and Ishbosheth is declared king over the other 11. And it says, Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel. And we get a summary of the reign of both kings. Ishbosheth's reign in verse 10 was two years. And the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. So Ishbosheth, we're already told right here, before we even get into the rest of these chapters two through five, he ain't going to be king long. We're, we see that right at the top, but we know that David is. Now, what we need to point out here and think about, David inquired of the Lord and went down and Judah made him king. There was a plurality, plurality of people that made David king over Judah, 
we have Abner that took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and raised him up and made him king. What is he doing by that? He's essentially saying, we're going to keep the line of kings in the family of Saul, in the family of Benjamin. That's, that's what he's doing there um, by lifting up Ishbosheth. So the chapter starts by giving us these two kings and these two kingdoms. And incidentally, we called it two camps because that's what Mahanaim means. It means two camps. And what we'll find later in Second Samuel, when David flees, when Absalom pulls his coup in the kingdom, David will f- flee to the same place, so you will again have two camps in the house of Israel. So that's where we get the, the name from here. Nevertheless, what we end up with after these verses is David in Judah, Ishbosheth in Israel, and that's the focus of the next four chapters. So that takes us to what we call the Field of Swords, our second section here. And that will cover 12 through 28. Abner, the son of Ner, and the servants of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, went out from Mahanaim to Gibeon. And Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and the servants of David went out and met them at the pool of Gibeon. And I, I pull up another map here just to show this is the, the trail both of them took. If you see Hebron down in the bottom, which would be south, and Mahanaim up at the top, the orange highlights the track that Abner and his men made, and the purple will highlight the track that Joab and his men made. Essentially what we have here, and it's hard to determine what's what. Some commentators will say, well, they, Abner's only going to Benjamin, so he's not being aggressive. But the text seems to say that he went there with an army. So maybe he is being aggressive, and Joab and his men went out to meet them. Now, we're not told if David sent out Joab and his men and Ishbosheth sent out Abner and his, but it'd be very hard to imagine that Joab is moving with an army of men without David at least authorizing it in, in some way. But they, they go to meet at this pool of Gibeon. Verse 14, and Abner said to Joab, let the young men arise and compete before us. Then they arose and And Abner said, Joab, let the young men arise and compete before us. And Joab said, let them arise. Then they arose and passed over by number, 12 for Benjamin and Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and 12 of the servants of David. So we have 12 verses 12 here. There's 12 men from Abner's side and 12 men from Joab's side that will come together. Um, And it says the young men. And you, you say, well, that seems kind of weird. What is the emphasis there? Young men in Jewish society were found mainly, their value was found in the fact that they were young men and that they had their physical strength. Old men were valued because of their experience and their ability to give counsel and and, um, guide the affairs of the community. So the young men would mostly be the soldiers. And you will find in the Old Testament that young man and soldier are equivalent very often. And so what we have here is effectively... If you said the the infantry, the grunts, you have Abner and Joab taking 12 of the young, strong men and saying, let's put them up against each other. Now, one question that arises is, was this intended to be a fight or some sort of sport? What, What exactly was going on here? And if you read commentary, some will say that it was some kind of competition that we were supposed to do. It's hard to determine for sure, but we do know what the the outcome is. But before we get to the outcome, don't let it escape you that it's 12 and 12. So you essentially have a represent, representation of Israel under David and a representation of Israel under Ishbosheth that are going to come and fight each other. It's not a coincidence that they chose 12. There's 12 tribes, they have 12 men that will come and fight each other. So we go back to the text and we go to this unfortunate outcome. And each caught his opponent by the head and thrust his sword in his opponent's side so that they fell down, so they fell down together. Therefore, that place was called Helkath Hazarum, which is at Gibeon. And that Helkath Hazarum means the two swords. So that's where we get that, that name from. The, the way the text describes it is these two, these soldiers simultaneously killed each other, all 12 from each side killed each other, and all 24 died at the same time. Um, The Septuagint of the Old Testament adds with his hand so that they grabbed, 
where it says by the head, it says with his hand. So you get the image of them grabbing and stabbing each other. So if he's grabbing this head and stabbing and he's grabbing this head and stabbing. So it's almost a, a simultaneous thing that happens here. And this tie that occurs doesn't resolve anything. In fact, it just escalates matters. And what else would you expect? If you see 12 of your soldiers die and you see 12 of your soldiers die, no one's going to say, well, I've had enough, let's go home. Uh, there's, there's the immediate instinct to defend or strike back. And unfortunately, that's what we get here. As we read on in the text, the very next line says, and the battle was very fierce that day, and Abner and the men of Israel were beaten before the servants of David. So we had the, the 12 and the 12, okay, let's let them come out. And they all strike each other dead, and then both armies start to fight, and we get just very succinctly that Abner and the men of Israel were beaten before the servants of David. So verse 18 says, And then the three sons of Zeruiah were there, Zeruiah were there, and that would be the aunt of David, the sister of Jesse. Uh, Joab, Abishai, and Azahel are all cousins of David. Um, and it's always interesting to remember those things. When I don't know what your relationships are like with your cousins and so forth, but when we get into Joab and David's dynamic throughout um, 2 Samuel, to remember that these are cousins, too, that, that we're discussing. Um, and, of course, as we saw this morning in Sunday school, David's got larger family issues than just his cousin in this book. Um, nevertheless, these three are there. Now, Azahel was as swift of foot as a wild gazelle. And you'll see in Scripture the idea of a gazelle being quick often being used. Uh, Song of Solomon has it as well. And it says, And as Azahel pursued Abner, and as he went, he turned neither to the right hand nor to the left from following Abner. Now, the idea that he's pursuing him and neither turning to the left or to the right gives us the sense that he's not going to let anything get in his way. He's going after Abner, and you say, what, what is the... Um, what is the urgency that he has to go after Abner? And a Jewish historian Josephus put it this way. He said, He was very famous for his swiftness of foot, for he could not only be, he could not only be too hard for men. Now listen to this. This is obviously tradition and um, kind of Josephus getting fanciful with, with the facts, but this is how they describe Azahel in Jewish history. But is reported to have overrun a horse when they had a race together. This Azahel ran violently after Abner and would not turn in the least out of the straight way either to the one side or to the other. So it's interesting to read a Jewish historian how he kind of colors the, the uh, facts that occurred there. Now Azahel will warn him, twi- I'm sorry, Abner will warn him twice in the text. Let's look at that. He will warn him twice. In verse 21, well verse 20 he says, is it you Azahel? And he answered, it is I. So in verse 21, Abner said, turn aside to your right hand or to your left and seize one of the young men. There we go to the young men again. They're, they're seen as lesser than the older men who are the generals and so forth. And he says, um, take his spoil. But Azahel would not turn aside from following him. Now this word spoil, if you have New King James, it would say armor. If you have the NIV or the NLT, it would translate it as weapons. And the point of it is, the, I, I like those translations using that because the force of what he's saying here is it was considered a great feat to defeat the general of another army and strip him of his honor. In other words, it would be a huge deal for Azel to catch Abner, defeat him, and come back with his armor to show that he defeated the king of Ishboseth's army. So his, Abner's first uh, plea to him is, just go after one of the young men quit chasing me. And of course, Azel says, no, I'm coming after you. So in 22, we get a second warning to him. And Abner again said to Azahel, turn aside from following me. Why should I strike you to the ground? How then could I lift my face to your brother, Joab? Now that's an important thing. There's two things he says there. He says, one, if you don't stop, I'm going to kill you. That's the first thing he tells him. If you don't stop pursuing me, I'm going to kill you. And he says, this would be bad because how could I face Joab? In other words, Abner knows that if he were to kill the brother of Joab, it would further escalate the tensions and the violence. 
And so he's telling him again, stop pursuing me. So what does Azahel do? Will he turn to the right or to the left now? Of course not. But he refused to turn aside. Therefore, Abner struck him in the stomach with the butt of his spear so that the spear came out his back. And he fell there, he fell there and died where he was. And all who came to the place where Azahel had fallen and died stood still. And the ideal here is he did not turn around and stab him. It says the butt of his spear, which means the end of it. And most commentators believe that he just ran it backwards. Maybe made a sudden stop and just ran his spear backwards. And most of the time, their spears would actually have a sharpened butt because that's how they would stick them in the ground. If you recall the story of Saul being asleep in the camp and David going in there and getting his spear, his spear was standing up. Most uh, historians and so forth would say they, the end was sharp so they could stick them in the ground. So what Abner did was just literally drive that spear backwards and put it right through the stomach. It's very graphic, uh, put it right into the stomach of Azahel. So he ends up killing him, and it says that the gruesome sight of one of the sons of Zeruiah here, of you had Joab, you had Azahel, and Abishai, and you have this gruesome sight. Everyone that came by stopped to see it. So it must have been some sort of sight and it's one of the big three. It, it's Joab's brother that is dead here. So it's a, it's a big deal. So Azahel ends up dead. And now we get another pursuit of Abner, this time by Joab and Abishai. Their brother's dead, 20 through, 24 through 28. And you can just see this thing unfolding and the wheels just coming off of this whole thing. It started with the 12, then there was the fight, and then there's the pursuit, and now uh, Azahel's dead, and now Joab and Abishai are chasing him, and it's like, man, this thing is spinning all out of control. And so it says, they pursued Abner, and the sun was going, as the sun was going down, they came to the hill of Amah, and that would be, I have another map here that zooms in and shows it to you. So you notice Abner took a detour to try and run away, and here's where they, cal- they finally get him at, at this Mount Amah, or Amah, And it says, And the people of Benjamin gathered themselves together behind Abner and became one group and took their stand on the top of a hill. So if you can picture it, they know that he's here and they're they're going in to get him. And what do they see except Abner with a a reinforcements standing on the top of the hill? And if you know anything about um, any sort of combat, it's going to be very hard to run up that hill. They have the strategic position at the top of the hill for those coming towards them. So we're again faced with the troops of David and the troops of Ishbosheth at a standoff here. And going back to the text, we have Abner again. And if you notice, Abner, Abner again is giving advice. Abner's um, trying to tell them what to do. And he says, then, it says, Then Abner called to Joab, Shall the sword devour forever? In other words, how long is this going to go on? How long are we going to do this? Do you not know that the end will be bitter? And in a sense, the end is already bitter. But he's saying it will get even worse. How long will it be before you tell your people to turn from the pursuit of their brothers? Their brothers, uh, obviously, in the sense of they're all Israelites. And Joab, Joab said, so recount that Abner had a, um, two solutions for Azahel, and he didn't listen to either one, and now he's giving Joab a solution. He's like, how long are we going to do this? It's going to get worse. And now we get Joab's response. And Joab says, as God lives, if you had not spoken, surely the men would not have given up the pursuit of their brothers until the morning. So Joab blew the trumpet, and all the men stopped and pursued Israel no more, nor did they fight any more. So they pursued no more, and they fought no more. Now, it, it's kind of weird the way this is worded. It says, Joab's response was, As God lives, if you had not spoken, surely the men would not have given up the pursuit of their brothers until morning. And really, I, and I think they're right, most commentators think that the if you had not spoken refers all the way back to the first thing that Abner said in this chapter was, let's let the young men come and do this. Um, and it's saying, if you wouldn't have done that, none of this would have occurred in the first place. Uh, either way, it makes the same point. 
He's saying, if you would not have said anything, we would have kept going. Uh, it could just be as simple as Abner talked reason into Joab. That, that's the other way you could look at it, by pointing out to him how things were about to go. And there was one other detail in there that told you this is um, how long this has been going on because it said it per- they pursued them until the sun was going down. So this ordeal has been going on all day long. So Joab consents and says, okay, we're going to leave. So that concludes that part. And then we have two marches at the, at the end of it, and that'll be 29 through 32 are the two marches. 29 through 32, we'll see Abner and his men march, and then we'll see Joab and his men march. 29, and Abner and his men went all that night through Arabah. They crossed the Jordan, and marching the whole morning, they came to Mahanaim. So there's his march, and where did they go? Back to, essentially, Ishbosheth's capital. They marched all the way back. And you notice it, it emphasizes that they, they went ahead and got it over with. In other words, they weren't going to stop somewhere, take a detour, and give Joab a chance to change his mind and come back after him. They went all the way back. And then conversely, the second march, Joab returned from the pursuit of Abner. And when he had gathered all the people together, there were missing from David's servants 19 men beside Asahel. So David's servants lost 20 total. But the servants of David had struck down of Benjamin 360 of Abner's men. Now, if you go back up to verse 17, it said the battle was very fierce that day. Abner and the men of Israel were beaten before the servants of David. That is a sound beating if you're talking about 360 to 20. It it was a, a very decisive victory for David's people. And they took up Azahel, they they got his body, and buried him in the tomb of his father, which was at Bethlehem. And Joab and his men marched all night, and the day broke upon them at Hebron. They too marched all night, stopping to bury um, Azahel in his tomb, and then they went all the way back to the capital of David. So think about the way the chapter kind of started with two opposite sides of Israel, come together and then split back apart came together and what happened it was violent it was bloody this is a not a very good situation and then those sides spread apart suggesting that there's turmoil to come and if you just peek ahead at the first verse of chapter three what does it say there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David in other words a, the civil war began on that day when Abner and Joab brought the men out there to Gibeon and had this contest, this fight between the 12 and the 12. So that is the overview of our text. It is, um, or it was for me, admittedly, a curious text to try and and pull out. um, There's not really moral lessons that you want to pull out of this text. Um, I'm not going to say when they, if someone tells you to stop chasing them, stop chasing them. I mean, that's not (laughs) an example that we rightfully would pull from this text and, and you look at it and you go, so knowing that it's part of a larger story, how do we conclude this in a way that, that, it, that um, I think does, uh, does honor to the text, that, that is there? And this is what I would say. Um, the importance of this text, and, and I like this quote by Del Ralph, Del Ralph Davis. He said, this passage should have a historical marker sign in the margin of your Bible. No, we have not yet heard of extensive Davidic victories, and we'll see that in chapter 8. It will be long before we are dazzled by Solomon's lavish temple, and longer still before we enjoy the just rule of the true son of David. But here, here, 2 Samuel 2, for the first time, Yahweh's chosen king visibly rules on earth. And I think that's so crucial to see. You say, what, what's so the big deal about this chapter? His chosen king visibly rules on earth for the first time. At Hebron, in the provincial backwater, being a small town, or a insignificant in the grand scheme, I guess, over only one tribe. Remember, the, the 11 are with Ishbosheth. He's only got one tribe here. Um, it was under Yahweh's guidance at every point. It is a small beginning, but it is the kingdom of God, concrete, visible, earthly. The kingdom of God has for the moment tucked itself away in the hills of Judah 
And I like how he ends this. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. In other words, of course it's going to start out small. What else would we expect? Uh, David was, was told 13 years ago that this was going to happen, and he's just now coming in and being coronated as king only over Judah. And let's revisit the beginning again. And I, I alluded to this, but recall it said David inquired of the Lord. And then in verse 8, what did it say? But Abner, the son of Ner, he did not inquire of the Lord. We have to keep in mind one of these kingdoms here is of the Lord and the other is not. In fact, the other is forsaken by the Lord. So in, in one sense, we have David coming back into the land. This is, this is almost a, another Exodus type story. You have God's people coming into the land and having to run out God's enemies. And, and that's what David's going to do here. It's almost a recapitulation that we see of the Exodus. He's coming in. He's come from exile. Remember, he was exiled out of the land. He comes into the promised land as God's chosen, and he's going to defeat God's enemies in the land. So we have that picture, but more so, um, we have a, a larger picture. And I want to go to Psalm 89 to conclude this and just read a little bit of it. Psalm 89 is a fantastic psalm that recounts a lot of events, but I want to focus specifically in Psalm 89 on verses 12, on verses 19 through uh, 27. We'll look at 19 through 27. We get 28 too is good, uh, but I'll, let, I'll save that for uh, 2 Samuel 7. Um, we'll just put a, like a marker right there for Tommy when he gets to that text. Um, so, Psalm 89, picking up in verse 19. Now listen to this. He says, Of old you spoke in a vision to your godly one and said, I have granted help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found David, my servant. With my holy oil I have anointed him so that my hand shall be established with him. My arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him. The wicked shall not humble him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and my steadfast love shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He shall cry to me, You are my Father, my God, the rock of my salvation, and I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. And I'll, again, I'll just stop right there. But consider what we read in Genesis 49 about the kingdom of this king of Judah and how it's starting to materialize through the person of David. And I think it's interesting, if you go to Acts 13, you have Paul alluding to this when he's talking about Jesus. And, and I love what Paul does here. In Acts 13, 21 and 23, now he's talking to the men of Israel, and he's trying to point out to them, as he always did, how Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah that they were looking for. And look what he says. Um, we'll pick up in verse 20. All this took about 450 years, and after that he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. We saw that in 1 Samuel. And then catch what he says. Then they asked for the king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. We know how that went. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will. So there's that allusion to Psalm 89. I have taken David. He is my servant. He's going to be my king. And, and look at verse 23. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. So bringing it back around when, when you go, what is the import of this text? Paul's telling us right here, here's the import of this text. It's that through David, God brings us Jesus, the true king, that he has promised. So I, I'll just conclude this, I'll conclude this way and say, as we read these stories, it's always helpful to remember that all of these events are working together for God's glory and for our good. They are all, they are all progressions in redemptive history that culminate in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is the true and greater David, the highest of the kings of the earth, and he is the firstborn of, new, of the new creation. And that's what we look forward to, and that's what they were looking forward to through this story. So that is um, our look at the text tonight. We have.
time now for some questions, comments. Yes, Ruth. Yeah, it's a. Yeah, there there were different reasons they would blow the trumpet, and one of them would be to gather everyone and and stop. You would blow it to advance an attack. You could blow it to stop. There were several different reasons, but that that's what he was doing. It was a signal. Uh huh. Because it was kind of a kill or be killed because everybody wanted the territory and because God said to go and go and take the territory. Um, it seems like they're always fighting. <laughs> well, um, yeah, yes, and, and no. That when are you talking about they being Israel and Judah having these battles? The big, the simple answer is to say that eleven tribes right now are being rebellious to God. Uh, one tribe is obeying God. Uh, David is the anointed of God. In fact, as we get as we progress through chapters three, four, and five, you'll even see Abner over and again say and acknowledge that David is the Lord's anointed. So the question would be: Then why in the world are, are you doing this? Why did you? Appoint Ishbosheth, and why are you doing this? And the only answer would be they're in rebellion against God. They have raised up the house of Benjamin and the uh, house of Saul as an idol. We talked about the idols in the, the book club, but they're holding on, trying to hold on to that power, even though they'll acknowledge that David is their rightful king. So even though their losses are so extreme, they don't try to negotiate a settlement or anything? Well, they don't have to negotiate. That's going to happen soon. That that will happen very soon, but but yeah, I mean they're they're like us. They're they're stubborn, and sometimes it takes a while for us to um, acknowledge our guilt and our mistakes and and turn to to the Lord. So, Tommy. Yeah. Yeah, Warren. Yeah, 12 versus 12, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they all, all 12 killed the other 12 in the exact same manner, but not at the exact same moment, if that makes sense. Sorry, I should have been more clear on that. But yeah, it's it was 12, but... Yeah. <laughs> well... Um, it's divine. Um, that's how, that's why it occurs. Yeah, that's, that's a good. Yeah, it well, it's a, it's a city and a, a territory because it, I I'm pretty sure I know that it was given to Caleb, but I, I would so that that's a good question. I'm not sure exactly what the distinction there would be, but yeah, it, I would say it's a territory and there's smaller territories within Hebron, but it's still considered Hebron. Can anyway. Yeah. It seems to be in that regard. So he's not out drumming up support. What should I do, Lord? Go there. And just as hey, you had before, he was out there minding his own, right? In First Samuel 16, mm-hmm. and along came Samuel to anoint him. And here you have the men of Judah come, uh, and they anoint him as well. And you wonder, of course, how much, you know, what did they know and when did they know right. that? Yeah. 
Yeah, and well, and remember, it was the men of Judah that kept tattletelling on David, going to Saul and telling him where he is, saying, hey, he's here. So it, it is very, again, the text doesn't mention the Lord a lot, but be sure that the Lord is, is working everything out in these, in these stories. So uh, one more and then we... Um, I don't know that it was common in the sense that everybody in all 12 tribes knew it, but we do have indications that there were people that understood that David was the Lord's anointed. Uh, you don't know if, if Samuel told him. Saul acknowledges it on many occasions. Jonathan acknowledges it. Um, so there, there are people that do. Abner acknowledges it. Maybe it was from the house of Saul that they knew that because David, you remember Saul was crazy jealous of David and felt threatened by him, and rightly so, uh, because he was going to lose his kingdom um, in a human sense. Yeah, I, we don't see the others. We'll, we'll see later when the other tribes um, rally around David, but we don't have an indication that it was just common knowledge. I don't know. Tommy or Gunny may have a, a different thought on that, but it just, the text doesn't seem to indicate one way or another how, uh, practically, we all know how things get out and gossip happens and people just seem to know things, so. Or, or even if they would have known, what difference Right. That, yeah, that's a good point, too. Well, we um, have time for one or two more thoughts, and then Audrey will read us through the chapter one more time. Any other Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a real good one. I have to write that down next time we teach this one. <laughs> Any other thoughts, comments? All right, well, Audrey, if you would be so kind.
Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to be here to study your word. Lord, um, I just pray through this text and, and through the lesson and the discussion that, again, we could see, um, most importantly, your hand at work through all these uh, stories and um, just gain a faithfulness and a trust in you to accomplish all that you have uh, decreed that you would. Lord, um, thank you for uh, this church, for all the people that are here, here come faithfully to uh, study the word together. Pray that as we head out to tonight and throughout this week that you would um, be glorified in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. He's the son of Saul. He was the son.